You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Maybe the problem is our economy was just too good for too long, or it recovered too fast after the pandemic. Whatever we did, we're paying for it now. As the Bank of Canada has moved its levers over the past year to try to bring down inflation and engineer what economists call a soft landing, it's become clear just how hard that landing will be for folks on the front line of the economy. Inflation is coming down, but it's still pretty high. Employment numbers are finally coming down as well. Interest rates, though, are still going up. And we are still technically teetering just on the edge of a recession. None of this is great for ordinary people trying to mm, afford life. Those economic levers are being moved in order to achieve what the Bank of Canada thinks is the best case scenario. So it's worth asking best case for who? How do we get there? How will we know if it's working or not? And what happens if it doesn't? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Jim Stanford is an economist, also the director of the Center for Future Work. He's somebody we call when finances are in flux, as uh, they almost always are right now, Jim. No kidding, Jordan. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. I hate to say that. Well, let's start um, with unemployment then. What's behind the uptick in for a long time coming out of the worst of the pandemic, good unemployment numbers were kind of like one thing that people could hang on to when they're looking at the economy, right? It was actually a very amazing rebound from the pandemic when you look back on it. You know, and uh, it's hard to remember the dark days of uh, early 2020 when the lockdowns were in place and mm-hmm. we didn't know what was coming. And uh, we had seen the loss of three million jobs in Canada in the matter of weeks. Never seen anything like that. And, you know, does that mean we're heading into a recession or a depression, really? And uh, luckily, for for various reasons and because of very strong, fast policy responses, including the CERB that was paid out by the government and actions at that time by the Bank of Canada to keep money flowing through the economy, uh, we didn't have a depression. We had a very short, sharp recession but we bounced back incredibly quick. And then uh, we actually ended up with a lower unemployment rate than we had had when the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly we had all kinds of employers uh, complaining that there was a labor shortage and they couldn't find enough workers, et cetera, et cetera. But from the workers' side of the the fence, uh, it was actually a pretty good situation because you could definitely, in most cases, find a job if you wanted one. And you could even be a little bit picky about that job. If you had been working, you know, fast food, for minimum wage, well, suddenly there was a chance to do something better. And we actually saw hundreds of thousands of Canadians change their jobs, not just come back to work, but change their jobs after the uh, pandemic. So uh, I think that was very positive, but unfortunately uh, temporary because uh, suddenly the Bank of Canada started worrying that the labor market was too tight, the unemployment rate was too low, and they actually explicitly came out and said it. Uh, The governor, Tiff Macklem, actually said unemployment's too low and we have to get it back up. Wow. Which seems kind of perverse to think of a powerful government agency uh, trying to get unemployment up. But that's exactly what they're trying to do. And and it's working. Now, uh, it's working in an interesting way, Jordan. Um, We have not seen a giant decline in employment. In fact, employment itself has continued to grow, you know, sort of slowly and unsteadily. What we have seen instead, actually, is a big increase in labor supply that has grown much faster than the number of jobs in the economy. That's partly because of strong uh, labor force participation, we call it. That means uh, Canadians are are actively working or seeking work. It's also because, of course, of the record immigration that we've had. Uh, We had the borders closed to immigration largely for a period during the pandemic. But then we threw the doors wide open after that. So we've had both uh, sort of permanent normal immigration channels, but also temporary workers and a huge influx of uh, international students who now have unlimited ability to work while they're here. Right. And uh, so what we've seen is a, a big increase in labor supply that's outstripped labor demand. And that is what's caused the unemployment. And on the one hand, I think that's better than actually destroying jobs. We haven't seen that happening in a big way yet. 
but it still means there are hundreds of thousands of uh, Canadians who are uh, trying to find work or worried that they'll lose their jobs. And and every now and then you see that human face. I I saw a a post uh, the other day on uh, TikTok of a huge lineup of people outside of Walmart in Mississauga because they were having an open hiring day. And this is for a job at Walmart that uh, almost certainly pays just barely minimum wage. So every now and then you're kind of slapped in the face to remember, you know what, the, this is actual human beings we're talking about. Why would a government want to increase uh, unemployment? And I, I guess I shouldn't say government directly, but why would the bank want to do that? Yeah, well, um, it kind of stems from a, an old economic theory that um, you have to have a desired level of unemployment in the economy in order to keep workers in line, to discipline their work effort, and to check their wage demands. None of that sounds great. Yeah, the theory over the years has gone by various names. Milton Friedman called it the natural rate of unemployment. That's a kind of a loaded term, isn't it? Because if it's natural, there's nothing you can do about it, and and it's good. Um, More recently, economists called it a a real mouthful, non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, or NIRU is the acronym. Okay. The idea is that there's some magic number where the economy has got just enough unemployed people to keep uh, wages in check and therefore reduce inflation, but not so much that you're in an actual recession. The problem is that, the, first of all, the theory underlying what that level is and what explains it is very uh, iffy. Mm-hmm. But even worse, they cannot measure it. They can't see it. And attempts to measure it by looking at historical trends and so on have, have failed. And it seems that the so-called NIRU bounces around all the time. They used to think in Canada it was high as 9% unemployment. Now the Bank of Canada probably thinks it's around 6% or maybe a little higher They don't put a number out publicly, but they still clearly are guided by the concept. Oh, boy. But if it can't be measured and it isn't stable, it isn't really useful for policy purposes. And I think it's a mistake to assume that you have to increase unemployment in order to keep inflation in check. And that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy if, in fact, you engineer a certain level of unemployment because you believe that's what's required you can actually lock in that level of unemployment and cause significant longer term economic damage. I'm going to put on uh, my nihilist slash socialist hat just for a moment here and say that just sounds like a way to keep the working man down. Well, uh, there's another term for this whole theory, and it goes back to uh, another uh, economic theorist named Karl Marx. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> he called it the reserve army of unemployment and oh, in boy. essence was trying to describe the same thing. Uh, so, you know, you can put that nihilist socialist hat on, uh, Jordan, and I think you're you're getting at something. You're getting at a situation where the economy is managed in a way to uh, ensure that businesses can find the labor they need and hire them at a profitable rate of wages. Mm-hmm. The other side of the fence, you know, when when employers complain about labor shortage, for workers, it's a, it's a good thing. I'll give you a personal uh, story here, Jordan, if I can. Sure. I've got two young adult kids. And I've, like any parent, sweated bullets over their prospects in a tough labor market. And I have seen how their lives changed when the unemployment rate came down, because first of all, they could find work and they could actually think about what kind of work they wanted to do and had a chance to to find it Hmm. and earn a living wage. So for my own kids, I've actually seen the human side of what low unemployment means. It actually means um, more confidence less depression, more opportunity, and more meaning in their lives. And this is what low unemployment means. And so for me to think that government policy, you know, the Bank of Canada in theory is independent, but it is a government agency. Government policy is actually trying to keep people like them out of work and to eliminate or curtail that opportunity Mm -hmm. is actually um, heartbreaking. Well, since you just touched on it, you know, you say like this theory is designed to kind of keep wages down without tipping into a recession. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I often am when I talk about economics, but I think we're like one more negative GDP report away from at least like a technical recession. Is that right? Yes, you're quite right, uh, Jordan. The the traditional definition of recession, and it's incredibly arbitrary, let's all acknowledge that says that you're in a recession if your real gross domestic product adjusted for inflation shrinks two quarters in a row. The GDP data is produced every three months. And if you've got two negative numbers in a row, 
that is what they consider a recession. Mm -hmm. So admittedly, it's arbitrary. So a recession can be very deep or it can be just two tiny negative quarters in a row. The Bank of Canada actually predicted that we might have that uh, very shallow recession or or what they uh, call a soft landing, where you'd have GDP hovering around zero for a while and you could get two negative quarters in a row. Now, uh, we're really walking that tightrope in Canada. Uh, In the last three quarters, we've had two negative quarters. The spring quarter of 2023, the most recent quarter, was negative. The quarter before that, the January to March quarter, was just barely positive. But then the last quarter of 2022 was negative. So we've had two out of three quarters that were slightly negative, not hugely negative, but slightly negative. But because we had that intervening period of mild growth, then it's not an official recession yet. Now we'll wait the next set of numbers, which will be for the the summer, July, August, September. That that has finished, of course, uh, uh, or will have finished at the end of September, but we won't get the data for another six weeks or so. Uh, And if that turns out to be negative, then we will be in an official recession. How would slipping into at least a technical recession, even if it's not that deep, adjust what the Bank of Canada is doing? And how would that actually be felt by Canadians? Yeah, I I think there's a bigger issue here than whether or not we actually have the two negative quarters in a row uh, to satisfy that definition. If we've got 0.1% growth, frankly, it's not much different than minus 0.1% growth. So the big issue here is that uh, whether we're in a recession or not, growth has stopped in Canada for all intents and purposes, and deliberately so. That was the Bank of Canada's goal because they had this view that we're producing too much, and that's what's causing inflation. And I I think that view is very, very wrong, but that's their story and they're sticking to it. So given that growth has stopped, given that labor supply is growing quickly, and given that unemployment is growing as a result, we are seeing a significant change in the labor market conditions that average Canadians face. Uh, It means the number of job vacancies is shrinking rapidly, it means the number of time, amount of time it takes to find a new job is uh, is getting longer. It means workers are less likely now to quit one job and move to one, another one that looks better because they're worried about their job prospects in the, in the future. That type of job mobility, which is good for both people and for the economy, is very much tied to uh, how high unemployment is. If, high, if unemployment is high, people just hang on to what they've got. Right. But if unemployment is low, then they start to look to see if the grass is greener somewhere else. And that's actually a, a good thing. The other thing that can happen, Jordan, is you get psychology involved in it. Uh, God help us for economists to start thinking about psychology, but it does <laughs> matter. The irony is if people think there's a recession coming, then um, they can adjust their behavior in ways that actually make that recession more likely. It can become a bit of a self-fulfilling fear. Give me an example. Well, uh, think about consumers, for example. So if you're thinking about, should I renovate the basement? Should I get a new dishwasher? Should I buy a new car? Should I take a holiday? All of those sorts of major discretionary purchases depend on how, you know, how much money you have and how confident you are that you're going to keep earning that money. Some people who are very well off will spend whether there's a recession or not, but many consumers won't. So they put off those purchases. Now, if everyone puts off those purchases, guess what? You've just created the recession. So this is why politicians are very loath to ever use the R word, if you like, recession, in part because they, they don't want to scare consumers into actually causing a recession. The same sorts of patterns can occur in the business community. If businesses think a recession is coming, then they will project that future consumer sales might be weaker because of the recession. Therefore, they will not invest in expanded operations or new machinery or new hiring. And then, lo and behold, enough of those individual seemingly rational decisions Hmm. uh, put together can create the recession that they all feared. It's a kind of collective irrationality, if you like. I think everybody uh, hears a ton about, like, inflation coming down. But coming down, like, because it's a percentage, means still going up just slower, right? So I have a hard time trying to understand what that means for the future of the economy. Hmm. Well, inflation has come down a lot, but the inflation is still positive. So that's the, the point you're making. Prices are still rising, but not nearly as quickly as they were a year and a bit ago. The peak inflation in Canada was June 2022, uh, over 8% on a year-over-year basis uh, that month. 
almost all of that was due to the big energy price spike that we had at that time following the Russian invasion of Ukraine and gas prices shot up and heating oil prices shot up, etc. Right. Now that has reversed a bit, although frankly, in the last few weeks, it's gone the other way. You've got OPEC and Russia trying to control supply in the world oil market to drive prices back up. So hmm. we could see another surge. And the decline in inflation is, uh, is certainly positive. And it also raises questions about the Bank of Canada's whole uh, assumption that the reason we had inflation was because the economy was overheated. That's the word that they use. Too many people were working and we were trying to produce too much beyond our capacity. And I, I reject that claim entirely. In fact, if you look at the historical trend of Canada's output, you know, it was kind of trucking along at around 2% growth in real terms per year until the pandemic hit. Then we had a, a, a big drop off, but then a quick rebound. But we are still well below the trend of where we should be if we hadn't had the pandemic. And, you know, the reality is Canadians are as capable of working now as we were before the pandemic. In fact, probably a little more so because, number one, there's a lot more of us. Our population is growing rapidly and we've also got new technology and skills, etc. Mm. So we should be able to at least regain the historical trend of our actual real output. But we're still well below it. By my measure, about three or four percent below where we should be uh, based on that pre-pandemic trend. If we were producing more stuff, then frankly, uh, we would have less inflation because there'd be less shortages of things. Hmm. Best example of that, Jordan, is the housing situation. Right. You know, the housing market, of course, is on fire. Not the resale price of housing, but the shortages of housing. The price hasn't taken off because interest rates are so high and people can't afford to buy a home with a mortgage. So instead, they're turning to the rental market. Rents are skyrocketing. And here's the, the, the great self-inflicted irony. Housing construction is collapsing mm. because interest rates are so high. And that means the business case for new housing is, uh, is much less uh, appealing. So we've seen dramatic declines in residential investment and spending and construction activity, uh, which is the opposite of what we need. To solve the housing crisis, I think it's pretty clear to most Canadians, we need more houses, not less. Yeah. Yet the assumption that the economy is overheated and must be cooled off has led the Bank of Canada to take actions that are decreasing housing supply at exactly the moment we need more. Well, I asked you about inflation to get to this next point and kind of leaving aside the fact that basically this whole conversation has centered on the idea that like our, our job market was too good. People were making too much money. We were producing too much stuff and that's all bad, mm. which like we could probably have a five hour conversation about that and, and get nowhere. And tie ourselves in knots because that's what you have to do to understand a claim like that. Yeah. But leaving it aside and, and going from the Bank of Canada's point of view, which is that they want to bring down inflation uh, and bring things back in line, I have seen a couple of analysis pieces recently talking about uh, deflation. Hmm. The tone of these pieces has been like, uh, the cure might be worse than the disease, and we shouldn't really want deflation. And that also sounds a little bit strange to me. Can you kind of break this down for me? Well, the, just to start by defining the term deflation, it's in essence the opposite of inflation. Inflation is where the average price of things in the economy is rising. Deflation is where the average price of things in the economy is falling. So it's not a question of lower inflation, as we were talking about earlier, you know, about 3% now versus 8% a year ago. Mm -hmm. There you would get into a negative situation where the inflation rate was negative and the uh, average price in the economy is falling. We have had that from time to time. Uh, for example, in the first months of the pandemic in early 2020, we did have deflation for a few months because everyone had to stay at home. You couldn't shop and everyone was scared. So the average prices that companies were charging for their stuff declined. Right. But it didn't last for long. And as soon as, um, first of all, the lockdowns ended, and then with the support of the CERB and very low interest rates from the Bank of Canada and other government programs, things got going again. And we got back to a more normal rate of inflation for a while until inflation took off. Usually, however, for average prices across the whole economy to be falling, that means the economy must be in horrible shape. 
And deflation is usually a sign of deep, deep uh, recession or even depression. Hmm. Now, in the case of the COVID lockdowns, it didn't last long. In the 1930s, it lasted for a decade and we had deflation. So, you know, on the one hand, an individual consumer might say, gosh, it would be nice if everything was cheaper. I could buy more. Right. But for the economy as a whole, uh, we have to be careful what we wish for. And uh, overall deflation almost always is accompanied by a horrible recession, very high unemployment and a very, very poor business and consumer confidence. So we do not want deflation. Uh, we do want inflation to come back to a, a lower and steady rate. The Bank of Canada's goal is to keep it at around 2% a year. Most economists think that a little inflation is actually a good thing. Uh, the reason being that it helps to lubricate relative price changes in the economy. So it's not like if the inflation rate is 2%, everything grows at 2%. Of course, some things grow faster, some things grow slower, and some things do get cheaper. Think about, say, a new technology that's uh, implemented. Right now, it's electric vehicles. We're seeing this, where it's expensive at first, but then over time, it becomes cheaper as it's produced in larger quantities, etc. So mm -hmm. some prices can fall, but you don't want all prices to fall. Economists think a little bit of inflation helps those relative price adjustments, and it's also a sign that you've got decent purchasing power in the economy. I think deflation is not very likely, although you know some people are looking ahead and saying we've seen this record-breaking tightening of uh, interest rates over the last year and a half. Who's to say that inflation will just stop at that magic 2% number? It might just keep falling, and we could end up in uh, negative territory. Uh, and that would imply a, a very deep and sustained recession, which is obviously what we don't want. I don't think the Bank of Canada uh, is going to let that happen. It kind of feels like we're in a bit of a holding pattern and it's not a really fun one because the interest rates still haven't come down and uh, people are facing mortgage renewals and all this stuff. Like, what did you mean when you said it's going to get worse before it gets better and better? How soon? Mm hmm. Uh, here's the thing about interest rates. They do take uh, quite some time to have their full effect. Right. Uh, most economists think between 18 and 24 months for a change in interest rates to be fully reflected in consumer decisions, new lending, uh, new investments by business, etc. cetera. Uh, this is because, for example, mortgages, most people have a mortgage that's locked in for some time, you know, it might be a year or three years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not an instant change. Uh, consumer spending decisions take time as uh, people look out at the world and decide that they're going to fix up the basement or not fix up the basement. We are just 18 months past the very first increase in interest rates that the Bank of Canada implemented in March 2022 uh, after inflation started uh, rearing its head. Um, so we've you know, really just digested the first of those increases. We've had 10 in total. Wow. So that means the pain from interest rate adjustments that are already in the pipeline has not been fully felt. So this is why I say it's going to get worse before it gets better. That's because my mortgage personally hasn't renewed. That's when the pain will be felt. When's the big day, Jordan? I'll, uh, I'll think of you. <laughs> oh, God. Some, sometime, uh, so probably around this time next year. Next year. Exactly. So I was really hoping you were going to say, actually, we're almost there. <laughs> Also, the, the response of inflation, while it's come down a lot, it's mostly because of the changes in energy prices, as I mentioned, and the Bank of Canada still thinks that the sort of underlying inflation measures are too high. So right. my bet is we'll see at least one more increase in interest rates from the Bank of Canada, in addition to that continuing pain from interest rate hikes that are already in the pipeline. So I think we've got two big scenarios uh, ahead of us, Jordan. Uh, the good case is what the bank calls the soft landing, where we would sort of hover where we're at for around 0% growth. It might be a bit above, it might be a bit below. We might have a technical recession in that scenario, but it's you know a bit of semantics to, to think of that. And then after a year or 18 months of that, then inflation is tamed, the Bank of Canada can cut interest rates and we'll get the economy growing at a normal pace again. That is still a painful scenario. We'll still see, you know, three or 400,000 uh, more Canadians in unemployment. We'll see a locking in of the decline in real purchasing power that uh, workers have experienced since this inflation took off. And we'll see pressure on government from uh, uh, higher deficits that always accompany a, a period of slow growth. So that's the good case. The bad case is that we slip into what I call a real recession of uh, declining employment 
and uh, probably uh, something like eight or nine percent unemployment for at least a year or two. And uh, that would be much more painful. The question is, can the Bank of Canada fine tune things enough to get the soft landing without the full on recession? And people aren't sure. You know, you kind of place your bets on that. But neither of those scenarios, frankly, is very appealing. And I would prefer a situation where we thought about other ways to get inflation under control and recognize we should be producing more, not producing less, especially on things like housing. So in that regard, you know, I think that that is a bit of a devil's choice between a soft landing and an actual recession. If we were more open minded in how we understood inflation and combated it, uh, I think we could uh, imagine a better future. Jim, thank you for this. And that's what we get for having such a good economy. It's a pleasure to join you, Jordan. Thanks for having me. Jim Stanford, as always, one of our favorite people to talk to about the economy. And speaking of the economy, as you may have heard by now, we're working on a little project related to trying to afford life, as I mentioned in the intro. If you have a question or something you're struggling to afford or a category of the economy you'd like us to explore more, or you're just wondering how to survive as inflation stays high, interest rates keep going up, etc., etc., you know the drill, please ask us a question. We are hoping people reach out with real scenarios we can help with. If you'd like to do that, you can email us. Hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca is that address. And you can call us and leave us a voicemail, 416-935-5935. The Big Story is available in every single podcast player, and it's on every single smart speaker. All you got to do is ask them to play The Big Story podcast. And if you're listening to this in an app, that lets you review or share or follow or subscribe or whatever, you know what to do. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.